Uh, thank you so much for inviting, um, and thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, yes, we are we are um, professors, researchers, um, practitioners here in Karlsruhe, in the south of Germany, kind of exploring the idea uh, of how we could uh, imagine a future in the building industry. But uh, before we imagine um, the question of um, the future, let me just give you a, a small little wrap up on the status quo of the building industry as we know it in Europe. I'm sure you all know these numbers, but I just want to kind of refresh them for us so we know what we're talking about. The building industry in Europe uh, is responsible for 50% of the primary energy consumption. It is also responsible for 40% of CO2 emissions and other greenhouse gases. It is responsible for 36% of solid waste by weight, and it is responsible for 50% of the primary resource consumption. The question that um, that comes along is um, if it is so that the, the primary question of resources um, um, is, is one of the major assets of the building industry. Uh, we already know that in the 1970s, the Club of Rome uh, tried to estimate uh, how long these resources uh, would actually last for us in order to continue the way uh, that we are building and continue the way how we are doing practice. Um, at that time, the 1970s, um, that was a kind of a, um, a model, a kind of computer-based, the first computer-based model um, done by the MIT. Um, but this foil here shows that um, the German Ministry of Economics um, in 2005 uh, redid the whole calculation again uh, with maybe newer tools, not necessarily better tools, but newer tools and new information. And what you see here is basically um, different metals and minerals in our earth crust and basically how long the reserve will be in years. That means the reserve is that part of a resource that we are available uh, to um, activate for the um, building sector or for the building process. Uh, and the resource and the reserve are not necessarily the same. So for example, when you think of copper, of course, um, on the Earth's crust, Earth crust, we have copper that is accessible uh, in economics and, and, and economical and, and also ecological needs in terms. Of course, there's a lot of um, copper in, in the core of our Earth, but you can imagine with our technical means and our economic and ecological ethics, uh, this copper is not available for us. So when we talk about a reserve, it is that part of a resource that today is available for humanity. And then when you start looking at these numbers, and um, please um, uh, kind of take notice that this is done in 2005. So these numbers are 16 years old. So when you look at lead or at iron core or necessarily at zinc and tink, uh, you see uh, that in, at, in 16 or 16 years ago, um, the German government uh, figured out uh, that uh, zinc and tin will only last for another 23 years. So that means, and you know what, if these numbers by one or two or whatever, by 10 uh, differ, doesn't matter, but you see that we are in a, in a dead end road and that uh, a lot of our resources um, are coming to an end. So that we are in a finite process and that the way how we are doing our business, how we build, uh, how we run our economy is basically a linear model. That means that we take something out of the earth crust, we construct something or produce something, and then usually by the end of life, we destroy it or we dump it or we, we, we um, put it um, in uh, any incineration plant. Um, it is true, or it is, it is a fact when you look now, and I'm sorry that this for is in, in German, but when you look at where, for example, all the biggest waste materials or the highest numbers of waste material in that foil uh, is looking at Germany, uh, comes from, you see on the very left, uh, you see uh, the column, uh, which is basically all the rubble and all the waste materials coming from the building sector. And you see that this is by far uh, the, the, the largest amount that we have in Germany in terms of solid weight is actually coming from the building industry. That includes, for example, all examination waste. That means when you dig in a hole in the ground that is considered, at least uh, in the European Union, as waste because the moment you touch earth with a, with a shuffle, 
uh, that means you have to deal with it. You cannot simply put it back um, to, to natural earth, but you have to, to, to measure it. You have to see if there anything is containing that could be uh, possibly hazard or dangerous. And therefore, uh, in the European Union, we consider everything that is taken out as examination material also as waste material. Um, and the biggest problem that we have is, is shown in this picture. The reason why most of our buildings, when they come to an end of life product, become waste uh, is simply the fact how we build them. You see here how many different materials, how many different construction systems, uh, how many different connection systems are usually uh, used in, in, um, in contemporary building technology. And you can imagine uh, that um, taking these materials here apart is actually an act of, of, um, of yeah, hopelessness <laughs> because uh, investing time, investing uh, money um, to separate these, um, these uh, materials and these components um, is not economically today not feasible. But it's not any, we should not look to it from the end, but we should look at it from the beginning and then uh, the responsibility comes to us architects and engineers because the way how we considered and how we planned and how we constructed that building was never meant to be part of a circular system where despite the linear system, as I just described, uh, the circular system is, is kind of considered uh, endless loop where materials, components um, would kind of feed back after a certain uh, usage phase into a circular metabolism and becoming raw material again for new construction um, tasks. Um, in 1962, that was even before the Club of Rome, uh, Richard Rogers uh, drew these diagrams. The first one um, is the so-called linear model, as I just described. So you have an input, uh, which he described in 1962 as coal, oil, and nuclear, um, that is produced then into food, energy, and goods. And that comes to, a, yeah, he called it a city, or let's call it a built environment. Um, and then when that material is not used, he has an output and that output he describes as organic waste, as emissions, of course, uh, which is our biggest problem today, and inorganic wastes. But in the same book, um, In Cities for a Small Planet, he basically already showed um, the, the way out. So he gave already the, the recipe of how in the future we should consider a city not being a consumption entity. So basically a, a run through idea that you have an input and then you have a, a usage phase and a, a huge output. But in 1962 already, uh, he kind of introduced the idea of a circular system where we have on the left-hand side only renewable intake. That means things that are considered uh, in, a, in a renewable process. And again, food, energy and goods. And, and I think we all know that um, biology uh, is based on renewable, or we call it a renewable energy. The, the, the op only open system we have on our Earth, uh, basically sunlight. Then we have energy fed by the same system, and we have goods produced with the energy and the goods uh, coming from this renewable source, then becoming part of a built environment, or let's call it city. Um, and in there, uh, the possibility of an endless loop and the endless um, circular system um, as we uh, needed and as we try to implement. Now, what does that mean? I mean, how can we achieve or how can we go the step from a linear system towards a circular system? And basically what it needs is that we need to construct in alternatives. We need to rethink the way how we, how we build. We need to rethink the way how we use our materials. And we need to rethink the way what we do uh, with our built environment after a phase of use. Um, I will show you a couple of examples. This one is called, or I, mainly I will show you this one actually, uh, it's called UMAR, the Urban Mining and Recycling Unit. It was um, planned and conceived uh, by Werner Sobik, Felix Heisel and myself. Um, and um, it is located in uh, the next to Zurich, to the city of Zurich in Switzerland. And it is basically an experimental building. So what you see here is, is the whole building. It is called NEST, the next evolution step in technology. Um, and it, it, is a, is a, it is a layered system uh, where you find uh, plots, building plots, each one roughly 125 square meters. 
and basically the EMPA, which is the, um, the National Material Science Agency in Switzerland, uh, is inviting people uh, to, to show certain theses or to kind of, uh, to kind of prove certain theses um, uh, in, in the way of an experimental building. And the plot size we got is exactly in the middle of, the, of this building. It is this, um, this uh, structure here in the middle. It is a flat, it is an apartment um, where two people are living. And the question that we posed is um, simply, can we build already today in such a way that after the use of this building, and it is meant to sit there for five years, we can disassemble the building in its original parts and basically feed each single element or component and material back on the same quality level into a circular system. And then what sounds very easy in the very beginning, um, it becomes very difficult when you start thinking of your detailing of a building. So for example, take a window detail, a usual window detail here in Central Europe um, uh, that, that usually we use a lot of silicon, we use a lot of glues. And when, when we wanted to prove that this building can be dismantled after use, we were not allowed to use any wet seals. We were not allowed to use any glues. We were not allowed to use any foaming devices or anything that could basically prevent uh, a disassembly and a reconfiguration as uh, a new building material on the same quality level as before. So we had to rethink the way how we think window and how we put a window into a frame of a window. And you see here certain examples and certain ideas that we had. And, and what you mostly see is that, that all materials are in their pure state. So we're not using any composites. So the rubber ceiling that you see here is 100%. The black part is 100% renewable. You sim can, simply can pull it off and, and sort it. The glass is not glued into the frame, but you see here with the mechanism, a snatch mechanism is simply kind of pressed against the rubber and then you can unlock it and take the glass out again. The same with the wood and the aluminum and the plastic that we tested. So basically we had to rethink uh, for a 120 square meter apartment, we had to rethink every small little detail. We, we could not take anything uh, as a practice is, is using it today. Um, and therefore with at least, or yeah, with two architectural practices, it, it took us two years two years to plan this 120 square meter apartment. And I will show you a couple of examples of which techniques or which methods we use. Number one, and that is the easiest circle that we can think of is the, is the circle of reuse. So basically when you have something, you simply take it again and put it back into the system. For example, these doorknobs, there's a fantastic company called Rotor DC in Brussels in Belgium and they have, a, they have a, a virtual kind of warehouse of used materials and used building elements, which are mostly harvested every five years when the European Commission is kind of refurbishing all of their, all of their offices in Brussels that is harvest time for Rotor. So they hire a hell of a lot of people because there's a lot of stuff to harvest and to store and then to resell uh, back to other people. So for example, the store knob, that is now not from the European Union, that was uh, in a bank building uh, coming out of the 1970s from a, from a fairly known designer. And basically we took these doorknob from Rotor and we placed it one-to-one -one back into uh, the UMA units in Zurich. The same is true for the facade, or we have little facade, but what you see here, that ring is a copper facade. And basically all the copper you see here comes out of the waste bin. So we asked, um, we asked carpenters, we asked, um, uh, people doing roofing um, to kind of uh, collect the, the scrap parts for us. So for one year, they collected everything that they usually would put into the recycle bin. They simply kept it. And you see they come from different buildings. Some were kind of green, some were uh, black, uh, oxidated. Other ones are, are freshly from, from a, maybe a piece that was cut. And we try to design with these elements and then come up with a concept of, of, a, of a aesthetic that is adhering to the, to the idea of collecting uh, the, the building materials. Now, the second one is the reconfigure. That means that we take materials or components, but we don't keep them in their physical form. So we are changing their physiognomy, um, but the material itself uh, is kept uh, the way how uh, it was originally conceived. 
There's a super interesting company, maybe you heard about that in the Netherlands, um, Stone Cycling. So basically what they take is, is mineral rubble from construction sites. Um, and then they're sorted by color. So left, you see a sandstone. In the middle, you see a, a, a typical uh, burned brick stone. In the right, you see um, a concrete um, um, a recycling material. Um, and then they add um, a natural clay, 10 to 20% natural clay, and reburn with the rubble and the natural clay again, uh, the system. And then you have a so-called waste brick. In the very beginning, they tried to market that product uh, by the name Waste Brick, and nobody wanted to buy it. And they figured out maybe it has to do with the name, because who wants to live in waste? And then they got a, a fantastic idea with the help of some experts, and they started to mix all the colors in between. So, for example, they took some uh, ceramics from old uh, wash basins or some 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 uh, uh, china wear and they added that to the reddish color of a brick and then they called it not anymore uh, the waste brick but it was called you see it on the top it was called truffle and then they had mushroom and then they had nougat and they had aubergine and they had orange and all of a sudden <laughs> they become super successful i think they opened now their third plant uh, in the netherlands they got the commission for the new headquarter of google in london so um, by changing the name and, and, and not call it waste, but call it or give it a, a different value, a new value, all of a sudden the company became super successful and, and makes a hell of money right now. Um, for the UMA unit, we took nougat, you see it here. It's a sandstone mixed with some uh, brick elements, some burned brick elements. And also we were able with the company to change the shape. So we, we added a couple of elements because we also want to show and to test uh, if we can use the stone material without using any mortar, because mortar, again, is a glue. And at the end, the stone would be kind of, um, um, or the quality of the stone would diminish uh, the moment you add glue. So here, we came up with a system uh, that we simply kind of layered the stones and used these metal rods uh, to take the position and like a comb, uh, took it from top down. And basically having the idea that when you when you uh, dis disassemble this building, you simply take the stones off, or you can maybe in between change the material very easily without having a lot of um, hassle to do so. That is a wall element within the apartment. Behind the wall, there is the kitchen. Where we are standing right now is the living room, and the inhabitants can decide if that room should be one or should be divided up into two. And this is the division wall uh, that you're looking at right now. The same uh, is true for the bathroom. So we work with a company in London. Uh, it's called Smile Plastics and they collect in HDPE. That is the highest quality of, of plastics, uh, mostly used, for example, for cutting boards in the kitchen, also for medical appliances. Um, and they are producing a fantastic material, um, um, which is called black dapple. So they're, they're mixing colors. Um, and we use that in one of the bathrooms to clad the whole walls. Um, uh, we actually screwed them down to the, to the structure uh, with a with a, a dry sealing element. So by pressing it, we, we could kind of get rid of all the questions of silicons and wet sealants and everything that is that is uh, that we didn't want to have. Um, and also it gets a, a super interesting psychedelic um, kind of kind of impression, uh, which we really liked. And um, it's called now the Zurich model um, um, there in Dubenberg. German company called Magna Glass Karmic. Basically, they are collecting glass, so broken glass, and not necessarily for windows, but mostly from bottles and from other collectives that households are collecting. And uh, what they do is they produce a new material out of it by simply starting to melt it. So they do not fully melt the material, but they put the glass uh, spreads on top of each other. And the end, you get a plate of approximately 20 to 25 millimeters thickness. And what you see is still the shape of these of these broken glass elements. Um, it's super beautiful. Uh, as I said, they call glass uh, ceramics, and you can get it in different colors: in white, in green, in brown, in blue, and whatever whatever uh, color you can get a glass. And we use that material for the second bathroom uh, in the in the uh, unit. Uh, we had two bathrooms because we have two people living there, two PhD students, um, and um, did the same trick. So basically, we we put it on the wall, um, we, we screwed it down and um, did not use any uh, wet sealants. Um, and then the third uh, cycle that we introduced after reuse and reconfigure uh, is the biological cycle, so the composting. 
Um, and um, there uh, we, we implemented a little bit of research we are doing here in Karlsruhe uh, that is based on mycelium, so on the root network of mushrooms. Um, and that is the biggest part actually of the organism of a mushroom. And, and the funny thing is that you can use that as a biological glue because when two of these mycelium root systems they meet, you see that they fuse together instead of growing atop on, on or below of each other. And therefore you can use it actually as a, as a binder, as a biological binder. I mean, look at it on the microscopic um, um, level. You see that these, that these elements uh, create a kind of a network that is maybe a little bit comparable to a, to a bone structure. And we all know the, uh, how, how strong uh, bones actually uh, can get. Here in Karlsruhe and um, uh, before in Singapore, who we're doing research on, on these materials and how we can uh, grow the new bricks. Um, and uh, remember, I said before, that is basically a renewable energy um, uh, that we are using, yeah, sunlight, or basically the idea that with organic waste that come from the food industry, uh, we can basically grow these bricks or use the mycelium as an organic glue to grow uh, these remains of the biological circle together uh, and create a brick or structure-like elements. Um, uh, and uh, depending on which um, aggregate you give to the, to the mushroom, you can create different building materials. So for example, here, uh, this was done with uh, potato peels. Uh, the ones before were do with bamboo waste. The one before was done with wood waste. So depending on what, what you would like to create, you can feed the, the mushroom different um, elements and you get the different building materials. Uh, we did structures already together with Philip Block of, of the ETH in Zurich, uh, here in Seoul, uh, or here in Berlin, in the Futurium in Berlin, where we show the, the feasibility of, of these materials for future structural systems. In the UMA building, we use the mushroom to grow an insulation material. So we, we grew plates, you see it here, and, and we used it as insulation. And we also used it as a carrier for our long plasters. So here we, we grew it in such a way that you have a lot of air um, uh, part of the, of the board, and therefore you have a high um, insulation value. It's completely organic. Uh, after use, you can throw it at home in your, on, in your garden and, and compost it. There's nothing added to it. There's no toxic elements to it. Um, and I think that is the, the second class. So class. So when we think about uh, the future, that we should reuse the material that is already part of our city, um, it is also clear that our, our demand is much higher than what could come back from that urban mine. And my belief is that that gap, that resource gap, needs to be closed by renewable materials, such, for example, um, uh, the mycelium part. We show these materials in the apartment. So in the, in the right corner, in the back, you see, again, this mycelium material. They had a lot of in innovations in this. You see the ceiling is not painted. It is, it is raw material. All the light fixtures you see are magnetic, so you can change the position of the lights. The, um, the, the, the car is special, I will talk about it in a minute. So we, we have over a hundred innovations uh, in, this, in this unit um, and it's very successful. So before we had the uh, pandemic situation, uh, the people living there, they, they had a rough time because hundreds of people came every month to visit um, the nest building and also these, uh, this apartment. Um, and we believe that there is a, there is a hunger um, in our society for these innovations and for these ideas of how to really think in, in circular terms and how to make a, a building not um, a, um, a special waste product uh, in the end. You see that we have these windows on the top on the right. You can see how the infrastructure or all the appliances were kind of planned. You, we have windows on the right in the, in the wall structure and you see the layering of the wall. You see it on the back again and the left. Um, so we show basically the visitors, we show how each wall, each ceiling and each element was actually constructed um, and to show uh, what possibilities you have. Or for example, here, the light switch uh, is basically a small, a small device that when you press it, there's a small um, uh, generator, uh, energy generator behind it, similar to a, to a bicycle motor for a light and then uh, electrical impulse is given and uh, the, the light bulb is going out, uh, on and out based on that, on that wireless uh, information. So we could use, we could uh, avoid 
uh, had a lot of um, uh, cables, um, roughly 50% of all cables were saved just by the fact that we used these light switches and not the conventional ones where you had to bring a cable to each switch and to each light fixture. Um, I talked about the light fixtures. These are the windows so that people can see that even down to the question of heating and cooling, uh, we, we kept that system, nothing is welded, everything is screwed, you see it here. Um, and the carpet is very interesting, also a Dutch company uh, called um, Deso, and uh, they did not sell us the carpet because they invented a way how the back of the carpet and the loop of the carpet is actually the same material. So when the carpet is worn down, um, they, they don't want to give it to you. They come and, give, and take it back um, and give you a new one. Um, and they basically, um, they basically charge you only for the use of the material and not for the possession of the material. So I believe that a circular building industry will come up with a hell lot of new economical models. Um, we know it from car sharing. Why should we not have a carpet sharing or a house sharing or whatever, a structure sharing, right? Um, so that, that, that we get rid of the idea of, of owning or possessing these materials, but that we have the idea of only using them for a certain amount of time and then giving them back into a circular idea. This is the, the address, the, the URL address, nest-uma.net. So if you have questions for that, please look at it. All materials are listed there. You find all of these, the images and the description, you find material passports. Uh, where all the qualities and all the, 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 the information is given for each material. And maybe to end with a quote of my, uh, Mitchell Joachim said, the future city makes no distinction between waste and supply. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dirk. Uh, Carlos, are you ready now? Yes. Thank you. Okay, I need to share my screen. One second. Screen two. There we are. Right, thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for um, this invitation where I had the chance to uh, listen to such a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll try to, um, uh, well, not reach the level, but uh, try to exemplify with some efforts that we've been doing. Um, some projects where we've been trying to, to uh, implement um, uh, several agendas, and one of the strong agendas has been uh, related to materiality. So I'm going to go through a number of projects, um, and I'm going to focus on that uh, aspect there. I've been asked to, to talk about um, our uh, town hall and civic center in uh, Oskamp, Oskampus in Belgium, and I'm going to start with that. Um, it's, uh, it was a, a competition to do a, a, a town hall, but also uh, several of the services of the, of the city, uh, city archive and uh, a number of other things. Um, and the place was a former Coca-Cola factory in more or less the center of the village. And when we saw this, I mean, this is 120 meters long, we thought that all the services they wanted to do, all the little, it was, it was going to be called a campus. So um, a campus of city services, all the things they wanted to build, all the little buildings could be maybe um, thought of in a different way. So we looked at the existing uh, building, uh, the existing construction that the idea was to maybe recycle the metal structure or something like that in the competition brief. Um, we saw the space, obviously it was not a particularly um, old uh, and therefore um, uh, heritage uh, prone kind of construction. It was built in, the, in, in the 1991, uh, but we, we saw all that space, we saw nine meters in height, we saw all that length. Um, and we also saw um, a foundations lab with load, industrial load bearing capacities. We saw 
um, even things like uh, entrances and trees and you know if, if you start to, to think where to put your buildings you're moving maybe models on a, a on a, um, a site plan you're also dragging all kinds of pipes and things that people don't see uh, but that exist and 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 foundations become a huge cost in buildings so Foundations, um, sewage, uh, even there was a, a, an electricity transformer that could be used, insulation, uh, steel in its place. Uh, and demolishing all this um, would be to acquire a carbon debt. Um, and to build a new building would be to acquire another carbon debt. And we'd run the figures and we saw that um, uh, the carbon debt would never be repaid by a zero energy building. So even if it's a building that doesn't uh, use any energy, it will not save. It would not save in its lifetime enough energy to pay back the carbon debt of demolishing this and building something new. This has been proven by several people at different points in time, and it's a fact. Um, so we decided that we needed to reuse, not recycle. So for us, recycling is like the the last resort. Uh, if you can't do anything else, then okay, you recycle it, but normally we want to reuse or we want to upcycle uh, if possible. So we wanted to reuse this building radically, but how to turn this into a town hall, uh, how to explain the mayor that this was going to be a nice thing. Um, so we produced these renders uh, based on the idea of uh, inflating these bubbles uh, within the industrial building and then doing something with it. So in creating this inflatable thing, uh, projecting this kind of gunch on it uh, so that it would stay. The gunch is uh, gas reinforced gypsum. So not with uh, um, the usual smelly resins, but done with gypsum. And uh, this is something that you can then cut and, uh, and, and adapt uh, very easily and then inhabit. Um, and this was the result uh, so we built this big public space where all the city services could be like a little village uh, within, right? Um, so to give you an idea, uh, this was um, the before, um, and this are then the services built in with uh, the roof, uh, with this kind of uh, uh, new envelope on top. This new envelope uh, generates, generates a, 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 a controlled climate in this space. Um, and um, uh, well, it, al it, it allows us to manage the climate without any heating. It is a non-heated kind of space. Um, I'm going to, to explain, well, the detail is very simple, as you can see. Um, it's just bubbles that are lying uh, on the ground in, in most places. In some places, there is a cluster um, where we run the main services. Um, all the um, the city, the city. Sorry, I'm going to use the same word twice. All the the city program that uh, had to go into this space um, needs services, of course, needs uh, electricity, and we didn't want to then need to cut uh, this um, industrial uh, load bearing capacity slab uh, to reach with services. So we produced this line, um, this line of clusters to be able to run the services through there. So we had to be innovative in the way to, to, uh, to manage uh, ducts and cables, um, not to need to break any of the existing uh, building. So this is the, the kind of section that you get. This is a, a trick to get natural light into these uh, uh, clusters. So these are um, uh, like silver foil kind of curtains that bring the light, reflect the light into the space. And when you're here, it feels like this is outside, but you still have a few meters up there. And then there are other places where the bubbles reach up high. And there we also have um, lights. Um, so this is the kind of shell. Um, and this was like the final uh, result. There's another agenda to do with transparency, uh, with political transparency. Um, and here's uh, Jan Companol, the vice mayor, uh, who was responsible for uh, these strong political ideas to do to turn the the, the campus uh, the city campus into a public space and to allow people to see casually uh, the meetings that were being uh, um, held um, okay i'm going to jump out from this uh, project 
and I'm going to go to France. This um, is the uh, the house of the project. It's the first um, cradle to cradle certified cradle to cradle building in France. Um, it's uh, it's it's the first part of a larger project. Um, it is the house of the project to discuss, to show, to talk about how to um, renew uh, a former industrial area in the city of Roubaix, a former wool factory, a very large wool factory, um, and to introduce circular economy um, into that uh, kind of location. Um, so the house of the project is the place where uh, different companies can um, make proposals or competitions can be launched uh, for different companies to go there and they need to find counterparts to um, make sure that whatever they produce is inserted into other cycles so that none of them has any waste. Uh, so uh, in order to discuss these things, this building was done and it was um, like a political statement also to, uh, to do it um, following the principles of cradle to cradle. So, it was very challenging. Um, I, I sympathize with uh, some of the uh, comments made by Dirk. Um, at one point, for instance, I come to the building site and I see that uh, some of these uh, wood is actually yellow. Um, and uh, so I talked to the guy and he says, yes, yes, yes. The protection uh, was not specified in your brief. Uh, but we, we've added the chemicals uh, uh, on our own budget because we want to do things right. And he was like, oh shit, how do I tell this guy that now he has to take it away because it's full of chemicals, <laughs> you know? So the, 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 that person was being proud of, of, of the trade and, and was actually spending more money than had been paid for to add something that we thought was disgusting and that would actually break our scheme. So that, that's, that's something we're talking also is important. You, know, you really need to um, engage in discussions with the people who are working in this so that they don't make this kind of uh, honest or well-meaning uh, mistake, which I think is very important. In this project, there's, uh, there are a number of things. There's, um, uh, well, there are, there's the idea of super furniture um, so we wanted this building to be completely reusable uh, or the parts disassembled uh, following the principles of cradle to cradle. Um, so anything like, for instance, a kitchen uh, had to be plug pluggable um, so that A, you could transform any of the spaces into a kitchen or uh, B, you could just take it somewhere else and transform any other space into a kitchen. So uh, also the meeting, the meeting room, um, uh, uh, we wanted to create a, a, a climate bubble uh, for uh, meetings in this large space. This large space is not uh, uh, climatized either. It is, it is just uh, either heated by the roof or ventilated with those uh, fans, I mean, those openings you see there. The lamps, by the way, if you're wondering, they are reused from uh, another building that um, the city was uh, uh, refurbishing. Um, and as you see, you can turn any space into an office. Uh, you just switch that thing and it has the Wi-Fi, it has the light, it has a connection, or you can inflate this uh, climate bubble for meetings where people sit down and it has to be better controlled uh, and you can then disassemble it and turn it into something else. So, um, of course, the building needs a, a, a manual, uh, an instructions manual. This, this, this is a part of it. So um, that people need to, uh, to learn how to use it. Um, by the way, these uh, pipes you see in the facade is a dry toilet. So uh, the toilets here are dry. There's no use of uh, water for this. Uh, and the outcome uh, following this uh, 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 patent, uh, the outcome is used as fertilizer for the soil renewal, um, the soil um, uh, cleaning program with, I mean, the phyto cleaning of the soil around it. Um, so that the plants are fed either by this or by what they find on the ground and they clean the, 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 the ground. Well, and I'm not going to go into much detail. I'm, I have prepared some other uh, ideas here on the same, uh, going on the same presentation. This is a, a mushroom factory in Kigali. Um, it's, uh, 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 there's a company that produced, uh, was trying to produce food um, and we organized some workshops with them uh, to see what the options were uh, to install 
um, uh, to integrate uh, this mushroom factory in the, in the area of Musante, so near the um, Volcanoes National Park where the gorillas are. Um, so we spent one week talking to different people. We talked to the director of the national park uh, and we found a number of um, interesting elements that could be inserted into this uh, cycle. The client had already identified um, agricultural waste from wheat um, because the government had uh, enforced uh, or uh, facilitated or encouraged uh, the production of wheat. And so there was straw but this was not a traditional crop, so uh, people didn't know what to do with the straw. Uh, there was not a natural way to, to use it. Um, so straw was a good substrate for uh, mushrooms. So um, the, the director of National Park said that he, could, he had a, a, a grants to train people to do um, jobs that would um, give them a, a way to earn a living, a cash crop or a, or a, or a, a food crop. Um, so the people living in the buffer area, people who would go poaching into the national park, and if they were trained to do something else, would not go poaching, uh, could be trained to grow at, at their own home to grow mushrooms. So what the client is doing, my client is doing, is producing bags of substrate with uh, the spores of the mushrooms, um, selling them to all the local people living there, and uh, these people grow the mushrooms, the nice ones, uh, and the, the ugly ones they eat, and the nice ones, well, they send an SMS to my client, and there's a van going around picking up nice mushrooms so that they can be um, then sold in a different kind of market. So it's a food crop and it's a cash crop. Uh, so it's, it, this is, this is uh, also um, meant to um, highlight the fact that when you talk, I mean, when you have these workshops, when you start to see who has what and who thinks of what, um, then you can integrate things into a, a circular landscape uh, in this case. Um, then um, this building, Nobelia, uh, Javier referred to it in the introduction in, in Kigali, it's under construction uh, at the moment. Um, but there was a lot of other construction that I'm not going to tell you about how uh, it is designed. Well, maybe yes, that um, a lot, um, uh, there is a big effort in uh, saving energy. So it uses 17% of the electricity that the, as the neighbors do. And it uses 2% uh, of the water uh, compared to the neighbors but also to be built with local resources and uh, using um, uh, responsibly harvested materials. Um, so um, some of the details that you see, I don't want to uh, extend, I mean, I don't want to talk uh, too, uh, too much, um, are for, for instance, there's this uh, mesh, um, it uh, protects an area where, uh, so that the windows can be made in wood. So, uh, and the glass can be really simple. It could actually be um, uh, non-glass. Um, so that uh, the, me the mesh, which is a very lightweight material that it, it's very cheaply uh, uh, brought into place can um, help us substitute uh, expensive or uh, imported aluminum um, uh, window frames um, and use, um, it's a eucalyptus wood from the buffer of another national park, Nyungwe National Park. It has a buffer uh, of um, uh, sustainably harvested eucalyptus, uh, which is uh, 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 it's, it's a kind of crop that is very frequent there. Uh, so, okay, uh, eucalyptus, I'm not a big fan, but if we have a rotating harvest of wood, we can use that. Um, it's red eucalyptus, so it's quite nice and it can, it's hard, so it can be used for this. Um, so um, uh, that can be done, you know. Uh, there are other um, aspects that I'm not going to go into much uh, detail to do with night cooling and so running uh, pipes through the slabs to make the slabs lighter. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, we uh, recycled, there were some buildings on site and they were recycled. So here they're sorting the gravel to, to use in the, uh, in the concrete. But uh, most importantly, um, I remember my lessons from, from school, um, knowing that the Romans used some kind of cement. So I told my client that there was something uh, called uh, putzolana, and so there was uh, volcano ashes that you can uh, grind 
and uh, you can use as cement or you can substitute. So we talked to experts on this and we saw that we could substitute 35% of the cement with this. So this mountain, this little uh, heap of cement is the first uh, natural cement um, made in Rwanda in modern times. We found that it had been used in the, uh, sometimes in the 50s and 60s um, uh, by some uh, people who were, um, had a different concern, but they wanted to find a, a good uh, building material that could be um, uh, sourced on site. Um, so um, the client found uh, a number of deposits of volcano ashes. We had them tested in Spain. Um, and we, we went for one of the deposits that had all the qualities that uh, uh, needed. Then we also tested um, the mesh Originally, it's a German-made uh, kind of uh, stainless steel mesh, but the idea was to use one of the buildings that uh, was around the site to test the whole system and to try to see if they could weave the mesh uh, as well. So to also uh, even generate the, 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 the actual uh, uh, finished product uh, on site. This uh, building has also been tested. This is the same building uh, in use uh, to try different plants uh, to the plants are the sun screens, the solar screens uh, to keep the sunshine out. And they are so locally uh, sourced that they are actually grown uh, on the building uh, itself. Um, this uh, also minor building, this is what the building will uh, be looking like eventually. Um, and uh, well, that's, that's what I wanted to tell you about this one. And if I have uh, five more minutes, which I think I may um, have, I wanted to tell you about, um, uh, well, this is one of a series of uh, renovations of buildings we're doing for uh, the Cervantes Institute. This is the Spanish cultural um, center in different cities. In Belgium, in Brussels, um, we were sort of given uh, to uh, uh, um, an office building from the 60s um, to do this cultural center. And well, apart from ideas like what you see there, that uh, it's a big window on the street so that all the cultural activity is visible from the street. So people see that there is an event or people see that there is a library uh, that, so they don't, they don't have to find out otherwise. Or there is a, a place that is a library, like you can sit to read books, but it's also like a lounge and then events can take place in that, in that uh, area. But okay, so the idea was, um, to reuse as much of the existing building as possible. So normally, if you if you get a building from the 60s, you strip it, you know, uh, you, you keep the structure uh, and then you do everything uh, new. We didn't want to do that. Um, so um, our concept was to um, to to do things with other three kinds of things. Uh, anything new is mobile so that you can take it somewhere else. Anything fixed has to be recycled from recycled materials. And we wanted to maximize the, uh, the use of pre-existing things. So we wanted to um, uh, maintain all the uh, HVAC systems that were existing, all the fire uh, equipment, all the MEP uh, installations. We wanted to um, uh, navigate through it uh, so that we could uh, implement the new use. For furniture, because we did even the furniture, uh, we had either um, we're using old furniture um, and maybe painting it uh, just to give it a homogeneous color or shelves using the old shelves from an old building uh, from the old cultural center uh, and just covering wrapping them up in something else or using cruddy nasty chairs maybe if there's fabric we cannot paint it by contrasting them with another color or exchanging materials with other uh, people through the web so um, this is what the library looks like. So the shelves, if you had seen them uh, before in the previous location, they would have looked, looked disgusting just by wrapping them up. Uh, I don't know if they look nice, but at least they look like there's a purpose uh, to them. And they integrated with the graphic, the red, uh, the red uh, logic of the logo of the uh, Institute. Um, or Well, those chairs came from the Goethe Institute, actually, because through this uh, 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 communication uh, network, uh, we got them for free. Um, and uh, 
Uh, you see the roof that's a, a felt made with PET, with recycled uh, PET from uh, water bottles. And well, we're using the ceiling to, to work with sound. We had a, a, an events room and we have a, a, a library in the same uh, space. So we wanted to break up the sound, uh, but also we wanted to, to, do, uh, to do an interesting ceiling while respecting uh, a HVAC or a, a, a services logic uh, that was done for another uh, project before. So we did, we did this kind of Minecraft um, exercise just to, to be able to adapt what, what we found uh, to the new conditions uh, in our project. Um, then on, on other levels where there are uh, teaching rooms, also uh, new things are mobile, uh, big things are recycled and then the pre-existing we reuse as much as possible. So the, the rooms, uh, well, they are circular just because teaching language we thought it was it was um, uh, we were trying to mimic the exercises that teachers were doing in the previous premises but what i wanted to, to mention is this recycled pet recycle uh, uh, sound absorbing um, materials that contrast with those chairs if you saw those chairs in the original room you, you would have thought that there was no way to do anything with that and uh, maybe you were right, but we think that with this contrast of color, we can actually use those chairs again and feel that there's something kind of uh, cool um, of sorts. And this is another one. Also, you can use different chairs by contrasting with different colors. Um, and um, uh, then, re, re, oh, well, I'm not going to tell you this other story because it's too long, but then uh, uh, other offices, rooms, um, we actually kept most of everything, we, uh, but, but changing the location of the uh, partitions. So office partitions and uh, rotor, you mentioned rotor, uh, Martin Heelen is a, a friend of mine and, and uh, I, I've learned a lot uh, from them. Um, and one of the things I learned is that uh, office partitions are an amazing thing to reuse because they're really easy to disassemble and to assemble again. Um, so following that lead uh, from Martin, uh, we reorganized the office space just by uh, reorganizing uh, the, the glass partitions. Um, I'm going to stop there. I think it's uh, just the time. Um, and I think uh, it's good if we have some time to um, also uh, have a, a dialogue. So I stop sharing my screen and uh, hello again. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really nice, the matchmaking of both of your lectures. Uh, let me remind you for the public that you have the chat open for potential questions to our guest, uh, to both of them or to uh, each of them. And uh, I will warm up a little bit with my own reflection on this fantastic um, lecture. I was only aware of uh, Wolman metabolism of cities, but it, it was very interesting to see that Rogers was uh, there before. I didn't know about the book uh, that early. And it was also nice to see the limits of growth um, at Hebel's lecture and these predictions on the scarcity of, of materials. Um, but my reflection will be that uh, in, in our time, I mean, in a year of these amazing technological um, challenges as the arrival to Mars and uh, yeah, like super powers of technology, architecture is some, somehow looking uh, backwards in, in the sense that we are kind of getting a novel language which is very much uh, in the basics of, of construction. I mean, in, 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 in your lectures was very clear, but also in other sessions that we have had before. And, and this kind of restart from the scratch, dismantling, removal, reuse, uh, to think about the expiry date of construction um, is, is uh, ironically uh, requiring a very sophisticated knowledge. I will, I will speak about proficiency um, because it's transdisciplinary, it's a little bit um, beyond our actual um, teaching uh, systems in the, in the university and it's very counterintuitive in the sense that um, it is not related to the intu intuition normally related to, techno to te tectonics, for instance. So my questions will be, um, you were both engaged in teaching uh, from a long time, so how do you think this uh, novel knowledge or this proficiency will affect and inform our teaching curricular systems. 
Uh, I mean, is, is there any number of things you have to build before you are able to dismantle or to um, to be able to this uh, to uh, dismantle a building? And, and my other question will be more in the regulatory terms. As far as I'm concerned, um, there is no compulsory certification for um, for uh, dismantling. Uh, I mean, to be able to dismantle a full building. Um, there is compulsory codes for uh, wind farms and things like that, but not for architecture. So what do you think is the future of this uh, beyond the, um, I would say the non-compulsory certifications that you are uh, getting from, uh, from your fantastic buildings? Um, that's, these are my questions uh, for you too. I wonder if uh, it um, inspire any of you or the, or the two of you. The ideal is that you get it to a discussion somehow apart from from our questions. Thank you very much. Well, if you want to, I can, I can start. Um, funny enough, um, it is for thousands of years, we built for disassembly, right? For thousands of years. And it is only in the last, let's say, 100 years that all of a sudden, through, as you mentioned, technology, as the rocket science technology <laughs> all of a sudden started, uh, we, we made building so complicated, right? Uh, we, we made it so difficult to build um, in terms of the complexity of the building process. So therefore, uh, what I think needs to be done um, also in teaching and kind of um, uh, getting a new understanding of, of what building actually means, we have to make it much simpler. We have to make it easier. We have to, we have to clarify things. We have to understand, again, each component. Today, what I see in, in the... In, the, in, 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 in university that, for example, um, the students take um, uh, elements of libraries from 3D software and they place them uh, and mostly they, they have not an understanding or a full understanding of what is actually meant by this element of a, of a, of a load bearing system or by, by a, a climate controlled uh, layering uh, on, the, on the outskirts. Um, and that continues, and we should be honest with ourselves, uh, when you go today and, and buy a material, or let's say a building component, we mostly don't know exactly what's in there, right? And we're actually not asking the question what's in there. So therefore, I think it needs a critical mode. We, we need to get much more critical towards um, uh, what we use, which materials we use, and, and what components we use. And we might need to get much more simpler in the way how we construct and in, in the way we understand our buildings um, from the very planning process. And as you said, put to the point of the dis dismantling uh, process, right? And as simpler that can be, as easier it will, it will be in the end to turn these buildings back into a, into a circular mode. And well, I think that. Um... Um, the, the aspect of your question to do with uh, teaching, uh, I think that briefs need to, um, to change uh, towards um, challenges of uh, transformation or, or reusing. Um, uh, so that, um, so I mean, the traditional exercise in architectural schools is, uh, how to create things, right? Um, so how to invent something that doesn't exist. Um, and uh, that, that doesn't, uh, I mean, that normally means that you create something really complicated as it was saying, and, uh, and, and there's no reflection about what happens next. But if you do briefs where you have to do something with something, um, uh, not, not all the time, maybe, but a lot of the time, um, then the question of how, um, uh, I mean, it, that, that would, that's an exercise, a good exercise in itself, but it's also good for the times when you need to create something new, because then you would already be in the mood for uh, reuse afterwards. Um, but the, uh, the, the main thing, I think, is to train um, adaptation to what you have, because, um, and this is related to, to another aspect of practice, that's uh, the cost of these things. Um, uh, most of the buildings I've shown are cheaper than uh, normal. The uh, OS campus was um, cost, uh, the, the cost per square meter was 550 euros uh, compared to 1600 uh, euros per square meter that would be normal 
uh, in Belgium, or the Cervantes Center uh, was uh, 300 euros per square meter, which is kind of ridiculous uh, for a cultural center um, in, in the middle of historic uh, Brussels. Um, uh, when you reuse things, it's cheaper. Um, I hear so often, oh, it is better, it is cheaper just to pull it down and do something new. It's not true. It is just not true. It is much cheaper to use what you have, but you need to think more. I mean, you, you need to, to, uh, to use your neurons in a different way. And uh, so it is not cheaper in neurons, it's, it's, uh, but it is much cheaper in uh, euros, right? Um, so, uh, so I think this exercise of, um, I mean, if you, if you want to reuse things, but you want them to be exactly like they would be if you did them new, then it is more expensive. But if you uh, can adapt to what there is and see how you can maneuver what there is uh, so that it works, then it is much cheaper. And this, this training is needed in our schools. Uh, yeah, exactly. But uh, do you think that we need a specific kind of training, like a practice uh, training, or should we think on a former um, system in which our students should be confronted to this novel mm. knowledge before they get to? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't really think we need a, a different kind of teaching structure for this. We, we need different briefs. Um, but the exercise of design is the same. So, I mean, we need to train our architects uh, to take this into account and therefore the briefs for each of the, uh, uh, you know, if, if um, this is happening in some, in some aspects, for instance, in um, things like um, uh, uh, HVAC, right? Uh, uh, the brief used to be, okay, we need to uh, climatize this, uh, these spaces so you need to learn uh, how to, which machines you need to bring in to uh, plug into the electricity mains and uh, do the job, right? But now a lot of those subject matters in architecture where, well, in Spain, we are almost like engineers um, compared to other countries. Architects are uh, very technical. So we deal with these things. Um, the brief in many schools is no longer that one. It, and, and even the subject matter is no longer called HVAC. It's called uh, uh, energy balance, you know, <laughs> or something like that. So it's, it's, uh, it, we've done that. I mean, that, that, is, that is already done. I mean, we already, uh, our students are already uh, training on how to be uh, climate efficient. So if they're also trained uh, by changing the brief, um, to reuse buildings, uh, well, it's up to us as uh, teachers to uh, put that kind of brief forward. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos. Thank I think you. he has another question. Yes, I, I had a, a kind of comment and, and also a question. So I like very much your project, but I, I think uh, they all belong to the realm, let's say, of, of singular architecture. Maybe the last one of Carlos addresses some more, uh, let's say, general topics like office buildings, no? Even uh, some of your projects, no? Dirk and, and also Carlos are, are directly R&D projects, no? So they are really research. So um, now my question would be related to how could we uh, refer all these topics or how could we bring these topics or what have you identified that also exists relating this topic of cyclic architecture in what Fanek called the big number. No? I, see, I think in this hundred years that Dirk mentioned in which architecture has become more complex, uh, there's something more important is that architecture has become much more. No? There is a lot of architecture. No? There is really a, a high increase. So I ask myself if, I don't know, you remember this essay by Chumi in which he says architecture is to too big and too extensive to be political. So maybe the new question is, is architecture too much to be ecological? So I don't know, it, it's a kind of, of, of a critical question. I ask myself while looking at, at such best practices as you are showing. So I think you, you have taken, taken a really deep insight in, in, in this transformation of, of architecture as a linear process to architecture as a cyclical process. Uh, could you 
mention some examples or, or, or proposals or, yeah, or, or, or dreams even, how architecture uh, has developed or could develop now, not as a single uh, building, but really as, as a general practice, right? which mass housing production, for instance, is able to be more cyclical. I'm sure you can give some good examples of this, both of you. Well, I don't know about examples, but uh, coming back to your, to your assumption that you have, <laughs> see, guys, it's not a question anymore if we want to or not. What will happen until 2050 is that the European Union will demand from us, demand to build in a circular manner. So the question is, how do we achieve this? Do we do it like the German car industry and wait to the very end and lose a hell lot of money and in the end fight in court uh, to protect the old system? Mm -hmm. Right, but the German car industry did until whatever last year. Uh, or do we say, well, let's start now and let's avoid the, the, the gap that we can fall into as a building industry and say in the end, oh, sorry, we didn't know. I mean, we all know, right? We all know since the 1960s, that's why I show Richard Rogers, we all know since the 1970s, but we did not act. And I think it is time to act, right? And um, it is not a question, uh, there's also an argument I hear all the time, um, it is not a question that when you build in a circular manner, it does not mean mean that you are restricted in terms of architectural expression or that we have to get that we have to take back from our cultural values or anything you know you, you can build anyway the only thing is we have to rethink every detail that is the only demand that we have and we have to avoid a couple of materials right so-called composites and we have to avoid a couple of connection systems which is which is not you know <laughs> not too bad to do but, but it's new, I, I agree, right? It is, it is a process of, of transformation that we're going through or that we will go through. It is a process of pain that comes with it because we have to give up the old good system. Right? We, have to, we have to say goodbye and we have to get up and search for a new chair that we can sit in. Um, but I think, and that's why I showed a couple of examples that within that process, a lot of new economical models will be, will be there. And I think economics will play the key role. I, read, uh, I realized already to, today here in, in southern Germany, for example, um, all, the, all the sites where you can dump your construction waste are closing. Right? Nobody wants to have any more of these dump sites in front of their uh, communities. So what happens right now is that when you build a house in, in, in southern Germany and you have excavation material from your cellar, you have to ship it by lorry to half of the Republic uh, up to the north uh, east, where they accept still this material. And you have to pay, right? To just for this excavation, I read the other day in Germany, if you have a single family house and you ex excavate the cellar, you have to pay up to 40,000 euro just to get rid of that material. So I think the market, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a liberalist, but I think the market will also kind of regulate itself. And you, you start asking yourself, can I build in such way or can my client actually afford in building this way? So just was what Carlos said, right? It's interesting to see that this type of architecture he's proposing is actually much cheaper than, than usually uh, or the usual, the usual way. And therefore we have to overcome a couple of our, of our assumptions, a couple of our well-fed and well-established um, uh, conditions that we have, and we have to move. Uh, otherwise, as I said, we, we are the, 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 the German car industry is then the, the, the European building industry. And it, it is funny enough, I don't know if one of you ever visited the, the Mercedes-Benz Museum in Stuttgart, when you go up there and you, you're shot by a, by a lift to the, to the beginning of the 20th century and there's a horse, right? There's a, there's a huge horse in, in a kind of artificial uh, standing horse. And it says that the, the, German, the last German emperor, Wilhelm II, Wilhelm II, actually said when he, when he was asked if he thinks that the car uh, will be the new uh, individual moving system, he said, nothing can replace the horse. And he does not believe that any car uh, will kind of replace the horse, right? And you're in the car museum and then you have this laugh, right? You say, ha, 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 that stupid guy of, of uh, Emperor Wilhelm II. But you know what? I think the car, the, the building industry is very close on getting on this horse. So I think to avoid this, this effect, we have, to, we have to think radical and we have to move. And I agree with you, um, we are not there yet, right? We are not in the mass market. We are not in, in social housing projects where this is rolled out. But in, in Germany, at least I see, or also in Switzerland, 
I see a lot of movements on the political side. Um, you know, we have now our, our um, national election in September. It is very likely that the Green Party is part of the new government. And I think at the moment that these forces are kind of um, bring out new ruling systems. Uh, so for example, here in Baden-Württemberg, in the state of Baden-Württemberg, I live, uh, it is right now discussed that every new building um, is, is, um, has a mandatory solar panel roof, right? Something you could not imagine five years ago. I can even imagine like 15 years ago, um, the German energy uh, system was meant that we cannot accept more than 5% of renewable energies in our system. Today, we are at 50%. So I think we have to get ready for this change, right? And, and if we like it or not, we have adapt to adapt to it. And therefore, education is important in university, as I said before. But I think also the offices have to change, right? It is not, not only the new generation that will be affected. It is, it is us, but right? it is everyone practicing architecture today will be affected. And I think as faster and as more radical we adapt, as more successful this transition will be. Thank you. A question uh, for you both, maybe more directly to Dirk. So when you, uh, Dirk, were, were talking about um, ca uh, carpet sharing before, it reminded me to uh, Buckminster Fuller, who in the 30s was already talking about the car industry and the ability to recycle the material and put it into the loop so probably Fuller is even earlier than, than Rogers uh, talking about this and, and re, you know, recalling to copy, to emulate from the building industry too, right? So yeah. really he, I, I remember he said something like, we've exploded already the resources to live upon them. Uh, I mean, for all the uh, humanity live upon them already, right? So that's that's a very interesting uh, re reflection, I think. But this was this was just a side. I just wanted to ask you something more directly, uh, and see if uh, generate some polemic. I know uh, Javier would, would, might be on the other side, so I, I wanted to ask you what your um, opinion about how uh, off-site construction, because you talked about um, avoiding water and uh, foam and adhesives and silicones and humid materials, right? Uh, so I want to ask you how much offsite construction, so dry construction, let's say built offsite, can help uh, getting towards this direction that you're, um, you're yep. explaining today. And on the other side, what does, what's the, what's the um, um, possibility to endure for the traditional construction, let's say based on mass and the water-based uh, solutions? Just very, very fast for myself. And um, yes, I think I think that offsite construction is a, is a huge factor in this whole this whole game that will come, right? Because you have a lot of advantages. You have um, you have a, a integrated digital design process. That means in the end, the digital fabrication um, uh, on a on a protected site it will be much easier. So digitalization in architecture will jump the idea of plan and will jump the idea of programming machines in a factory line. But basically what we draw as architects, we can hinder the uh, enter button and basically somewhere in the world uh, that thing is produced. Right? Um, so that, that will change, of course. And I think also socially uh, that has a huge impact. So uh, constructing these elements in a, in a controlled a climatic condition um, and then bringing only these uh, components on the construction site and kind of minimizing the time uh, in construction itself um, has a huge social impact, right? In terms of, of safety for the workers, in terms of, of health risk um, uh, for the workers um, and in terms of, of time and therefore in the end again, in, in terms of money. So I think uh, these construction systems, especially when they are done uh, in, in clever, intelligent and smart ways, um, how to use, for example, we have it here in, in, in Germany, the, the wood industry, which is, uh, which is living through a renaissance um, in, 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 in the idea of, of digital fabrication, how new connection systems, which were almost dying out because they were ex too expensive to do by humans, right, to kind of form the knots and kind of bring the connections together by hand, it was super uh, expensive, but now with new CNC technology, with new robotic technology, all of a sudden we realize how these connection systems have a renaissance and therefore influence again uh, the renaissance of this material, uh, the wooden material again. 
Um, so, so therefore, I think a lot of components, we talked about the resource and the reserves, uh, we should talk about digitalization, uh, we should talk about social justice uh, in terms of, of production, in terms of, uh, um, and all of that together, will, will, in my opinion, shape, shape the, the new idea of a building industry, which is, which is rapidly uh, changing uh, very, very soon. Yeah, and I, and I think that the um, um, uh, off-site construction uh, and the digital aspects of it um, indirectly help uh, something that is essential for um, reusing stuff, which is uh, classification and knowledge of what there is, the, the, the ID, the passports of materials. Well, um, knowing what, what, uh, what you have uh, is easier when that something has been uh, precisely done somewhere else. So it, it's, an, it's an indirect effect, but I think it's an important effect as well. Yeah. Actually, uh, I'm re in, another, in a project we're doing now, we're using a lot of 19th century um, building material, and it was highly standardized. Um, I'm not pro standard standardization. I mean, I'm not pro modular. Uh, but because they were standardized, which was the way to do it uh, at that time, um, we can very easily um, adapt to what to adapt to what we're doing. Because uh, you know we can we can we can keep different uh, same highs. We can put uh, things in the middle. Um, so that that uh, so we're we're treating 19th century uh, building material like windows and things like what they were. They were off-site built elements. That's, that's what they were. They were made by a carpenter in the workshop. And then that, that means that they have certain characteristics that make it easy uh, for us to reuse. Yeah, I think that's a very, that's a very important uh, process because I think digitalization, um, uh, and it's good that you mentioned that, is of course much more than, than the idea of, of machinery, right? Uh, so digitalization means, as you just mentioned, for example, the idea of material passes, or let's say of, of a cataster of materials which in the end will allow us to see when can we harvest which material in which quality where and when and therefore kind of uh, helping us to plan with these materials already in, in a second and third step so i think digitalization will help us to manage uh, this, this this material bank uh, that, that we will have in the future but the precondition is that this is actually dealt as a material bank and as, a, as something that is easy to be harvested and not as today when we talk about the urban mine. And I think that word is, is pretty cool, urban mine, because a mine requires a hell lot of work. It is dangerous, it is smelly, it is, it is smoking, right? And we have to overcome this idea of a mine and we have to come to a material bank and the material bank can only be managed with digital means. Great. Um, I think we have time for a last question from the public that um, has been uh, just arrived. I think it's a question for Dirk. Um, how would you say those kind of organic materials for construction systems such as bricks could be produced in a massive way and with low cost so that eventually yeah. could replace the conventional ones? Yeah, I think uh, we started this research a couple of years ago in, in my cellium. We're not the only ones, but but what I what I think is is pretty is pretty amazing about this mycelium is that we are not in any in any situation that we take away soil for food production, right? So a lot of these a lot of these organic materials, right, the insulation materials and and weed and flax and all that is always the problem that should we use the soil for the production of food or should we use the soil for the production of building materials? Mushrooms grow everywhere, right? The mushroom you can grow in your cellar, or you can grow in old um, in old um, factories, or, or wherever you have it, and you're not bound on on soil. And therefore, that is a that is a huge advantage over uh, other um, uh, organic building materials. And therefore, I think this class of building materials that that we can that we can grow, let's say, in laboratories, or that we can grow in larger uh, factory lines, and so on. Um, uh, they have, in my opinion, uh, next to the traditional ones as wood and, and straw and, and clay and all these organic materials, uh, they have a big advantage. And, and therefore, I'm interested right now in, in, um, in the research in these mycelium materials and kind of making, um, yeah, making, making it possible that we can use it in the future as an alternative building material and, and making it also um, a, a feasible economical model. So, for example, what Carlos showed, <laughs> very amazing that you showed the mushroom farm, right? 
Um, and, and, <laughs> and the connection is very clear, right? Because as you said, there's a win-win situation. Um, for example, we also sometimes take the, 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 the bags that they, or they, they grew champion or whatever onto it. Uh, and when they are harvested, they usually throw away these bags. They are full of mycelium, right? So sometimes we even take these bags from the, from, the, from the mushroom factories because for us, that's gold, right? And usually they throw it away. So I think, again, there is a, there is a, there is a, a win-win situation between food production and, and the building industry. And I think we should, we should play these roles and we should think the, the, the loops um, to the very end. And we should design these loops as architects and engineers and make sure that we can, that we can find new ways of how producing building materials.